Hi, my name's Robin. Um, I'm a web developer. Uh, for the past several years, I've been focusing a lot on PHP, actually, um, but have been learning more about CSS, particularly CSS3. Um, you know, as a PHP developer, you often have to do CSS whether you want to or not. But C CSS3 has some really redeeming qualities that I'm going to hopefully um, share with some of with some of them with you today. So, um, and I work with uh, Mara Khanna in a teaching capacity um, in addition to my development work. So the, the big difference between CSS3 and the previous versions of CSS is it's developed in a modular way. So it's this collection of all of the different sort of categories of features, and I'll show what those are in just a second. So that now for browser, instead of having to support CSS 2.1 and support everything involved in that, which we know some certain browsers have problems with that. <laughs> um, I won't name any names. Um, a, a vendor can choose to support certain modules or support certain modules first. So they don't have to get the whole thing working in order to get um, some of the features that their users and developers want to get those working. Additionally, you know, for really specific types of browsers, let's say an audio browser, you might not need any of the 3D features or any of these visual features, so you can focus on just the modules you want to implement in that, uh, in that browser. So, uh, modules galore, <laughs> every module you could think of. This is a, I tried to make a, um, complete list here. And some of these have just been announced. They haven't been, um, you know, they, they don't have a working draft yet. So this is kind of the, the full list here. And, you know, I probably should have thought of a better word than relevant, right? Those, <laughs> let's say they all have some relevance. But these are the ones that are, um, either, most of them are, sort of in development currently and often many of them are usable um, now and the ones um, I just picked out some that I think are interesting hopefully you will too um, active in that they're at a they're at a mature stage um, and so this is as far as from a module point of view what I'm going to be focusing on from that and this is this next list looks pretty similar, but from that you get some of the features specifically, right? So um, a little bit of a uh, little bit of overlap, but you know here I'm talking about specifically, um, you know things like border image is from the borders and backgrounds module, and the huge caveat here is browser compatibility. So a lot of things I'm going to be talking about are really limited in support, but they're growing. In fact, I taught a CSS3 class in April, and I've updated, I had to update the materials for things that now are supported, used to only be supported in the nightly build of WebKit, or now supported in Chrome. So um, good news for that. But we're, we are, excuse me, we are on the cutting edge a little bit here in that it's not going to work in IE6 <laughs> or 7 or 8, or eight often, um, and sometimes or in Firefox. Um, so we're really kind of juggling browsers here. And, you know, I'm sure many of you have heard this, this idea that, you know, it doesn't have to look the same on every browser, maybe. This is this new radical idea. So, um, you know, you can have something like animation that looks fine when, you know, the tab isn't moving up in an animated way. Um, and if you happen to have that browser, you get the extra bells and whistles. So um, kind of thinking about juggling those types of things. Um, and importantly, a lot of these are not a officially implemented yet, they're implemented on a browse, their browser specific property. So they, you'll often see the prefixes WebKit, which, you know, is going to be Safari, Chrome, iPhone, Mozilla, Firefox. So 
So I want to kind of start with the practical and get to the get to the flashy at the end. Yeah. So the question was, are, am I talking mostly on desktop browsers and how does it compare to mobile devices? Um, I guess I'm mostly talking about desktop browsers, although with the iPhone, it's a WebKit browser as well. And I, th I think Safari on the desktop is kind of catching up to iPhone, but for a while, iPhone was one of the few that supported some of the features like 3D and um, some of the animation features. Okay, so again, kind of starting with the practical, um, we've got some new attribute selectors here. Um, and this kind of stuff has been around for a while. But now we can do um, some amount of substring matching. So kind of regular expressions, you know, um, regular expressions 101, but you know, a little bit of regular expressions. Um, so you can match the beginning, you can match the end, you can match to contain something. So this has been around before, it's just adding some more functionality. So this is going to be, you know, class starts with left sidebar hyphen, you know, something like that. Um, and it used to be, or it still is, you know, but CSS2, you just say class is or equals left sidebar inner, 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 or whatever. <laughs> Hopefully not, but <laughs> if you work with uh, open source content management systems, that's what you deal with. Um, so that's another topic for another day. Um, Additionally, we have this new combinator. Um, and again, we're, CSS is kind of venturing into territory that was once more just the territory of JavaScript. So you're able to drill down through the DOM in a more specific way than you used to be able to. Um, so that you can, um, you know, we've had this with the uh, sort of the greater than sign, the sort of arrow symbol. Um, saying, you know, something is a parent of something else. Um, now with the tilde, we have an image of something, you know. So um, all images that are at the same level of the DOM as this um, note div. So more about drilling through the DOM. Um, pseudo, the pseudo class nth child um, we can now find the fifth paragraph, for instance, and notice that's in the, it's styled on the P tag, but it's sort of talking about it in context, right? So this P tag with all the other P tags has to be the fifth one of whatever its direct parent is. So if it's in the content div, this finds the fifth paragraph there. Um, you also have the option with the, um, using the integer and then n, so every third element, every second element, and you can even start with a particular element using the plus sign there, so starting at the fourth element. Um, you see here, starting with zero, you obviously, you don't need that, um, but that's the full spec for that. So. Not all of these are new, but here's, you know, more pseudo classes. When I talk about animation, I'm going to talk a little bit about target. Um, another nth um, class, nth of type. So looking for a particular type instead of just the child. So here's a little example of some of that. I hope you can see this okay. Um, just have some really simple HTML up there, um, a, an ordered, unordered list and so forth, and a couple of CSS um, definitions here. So looking for the third, the third child in, of the uh, list item is going to give you that one. And then the next one, um, this, with looking for the sibling, any direct siblings of an image that are within the content div is going to give you that, and noticeably not, not this other one because it's not the direct sibling. I'm sorry, the direct child. 
sibling, <laughs> sibling, sorry. Um, so um, a quick note, uh, again, with the practical here. Some more stuff you can do with the media rules in CSS3 is, you know, so this is the, this is the way we've been doing it, um, the way we know about just using the media rule for screen. Um, now we have these queries, really simple queries, to ask for not just screen, but for instance, a maximum width of a screen. So you're, so it's based on the output device that you're working with. Um, the second one down is um, has the only keyword. So only for a screen. Um, and something like this and color just is looking that it has a color property. Um, so max width, um, you can you can find the list of all of the, the possible properties. But notice how it's used. It's used um, in the media rule. It's used in the import rule. You can also use it directly in a, a style sheet link tag. OK, so for some, for some of the basic exciting stuff, and then we'll get to the exciting, exciting stuff later. <laughs> um, one of the big deals, which is almost, I'm sure most of you know about, so it doesn't, maybe it doesn't even seem like a big deal anymore, is support for rounded corners. And as you probably know, many of the browsers had this support before it made it into the spec. And this is one of those things where the browsers are kind of catching up when standardizing the way they implement this. So this is sort of the official spec and there are several ways of doing this, right? So um, officially, you should be able to have an elliptical corner, meaning that the height here is a little bit, in this case, shorter than the width there. Um, in actuality, when you want to try to do that, you have to be kind of careful between browsers. Um, again, the, the official spec, if you use a slash, you'll get that behavior on every corner. In Firefox, if you leave out the slash, you'll get um, a 25 point round here and here, and then, a, or maybe it's the, the opposite. You'll get 55 here and here, and you'll get 25 on opposite sides, so you have an unequal box, and maybe you want that. <laughs> but this is um, actually new in Firefox the newest version of Firefox, they did implement this tag, I'm sorry, this slash there, um, so that you don't get quite as wacky results as you, as you once did. So something to play around with if you haven't already. Um, even wackier, really, <laughs> is um, border image. So what this does is it takes an image generally a square, doesn't have to be a square, but um, it takes an image and maps it onto a box and uses it as a border. And there are several, um, there are several options of the way it does that. Um, but basically, you're kind of doing the slicing by saying that the width is eight pixels. So you're saying that this area of your image is what you're going to use as the border. It gets more complex from there, but that's sort of the basics. And then obviously giving the, the name of the image and so forth. Some new stuff with colors. Instead of opacity, you've got the alpha channel right here in the RGBA for alpha. So this is expressed as a decimal, so the 60% opacity there. And some fun uh, graphics type stuff. Um, We've got uh, gradients. So you can actually do a fair amount of, of work with gradients. This is sort of the, the simplest one, just using a from and a to. So we're starting at this top corner, going to the bottom corner, using a linear gradient. So just in, in a straight line, 
you know, going from one color to another color. You also have the option of using a color stop. So you could, you know, do um, a rainbow or <laughs> whatever you wanted to do. So that, you know, in this case, 80%, you can say, I need this to be a certain color at 80%. So you can control, you, in a pretty fine-tuned way, you can control um, the gradient. And obviously, this is great because you're going to save bandwidth because you're not using a background image. So, um, shadows, um, sort of like in PowerPoint here, <laughs> you know, so now you can, you can add a, a drop shadow to a box or a piece of text. Um, it's pretty straightforward. Um, you know, you give it some distances, a blur and a color, um, but kind of a big deal. Um, in some ways, because again, you save using images for this kind of stuff. Um, so now we're going to get advanced. Um, some more, some more visual options. Yeah, this one I don't know if, whether to put in basic or advanced, but um, you can now have multiple background images. So notice how this is, um, you can, you're placing each one. So here's, you know, this is just one property, background. There's the semicolon, right? So it's the whole line. And these three URLs separated by commas. So this one's at the top left, um, bottom left. And the way they interact with each other is the first one in the list is going to be the, the top layer. Um, but obviously kind of more designed to, well, I was going to say kind of more designed not to overlap. But actually, as long as you know what you're doing, you can have them overlap and transparency and, um, you know, transparency will be respected and so forth. Be the, the top layer. But obviously kind of more designed to to be kind of cut to be kind of more designed not to be kind of overlap, but to be kind of is to be kind of you're doing you to be kind of overlap to be kind of transparency to be kind of um to be kind of transparency to be kind of respected and to be kind of see that the top layer but obviously it's kind of more trying to say cut to be more designed not to be overlap, but actually is also what you're doing. You can it's overlap and transparency. Um, transparency is expected and so forth. But obviously it's kind of more interesting to say cut or design not to overlap. But actually is also what you're doing. You can overlap and transparency. Um, Reflection is another one of these things where um, something you're used to just seeing in Photoshop, right? Um, and you actually have a good deal of control. So here's the here's the simple version, all the sort of the minimal. You just say below, you know, the, that the reflection is going to happen below the main image, um, a five pixel offset, so five pixels away from the image, um, and then. This is, I, I realize this is somewhat hard to read, <laughs> possibly Im impossible to read, but the, the point being is that you can overlay a gradient onto the reflection so you get this sort of iTunes look, <laughs> you know, so uh, what's it called? Cover flow type of thing. Um, so you can see that the gradient actually comes in here just like it does for a normal gradient, and it's sort of added. Um, it's added as part of this definition. Okay, um, quickly a few, just a few text features I'm throwing in here to, to in the interest of being thorough. Not super exciting. You have another um, option for text overflow in addition to automatic or hidden. Um, you know, you can ellipse it. 
I don't know what the verb for ellipsis is, but you can cause ellipsis, ellipses to be shown. <laughs> Ellipsit, right? That's a verb. Um, so additionally, we've got multi-column layout, which is potentially a big deal. So this is where um, you, know, you want just text to flow from one div, but no longer a div, to another one. And you've got a good amount of properties available for that kind of control. So column count, column width, column gap, and even this rule here if you want to, uh, you know, a bar in between, a line. So web fonts. And this is um, something, as you know, that's been around for a while. The support is getting better, and you can pull it in from a URL. You can use several different sources so you have a good chance of it being supported. Um, here's the basic, right? So you just give it any name you want and tell the source. And then when you use it in font family, you just tell it the name that you've given it and your list of fonts, if you like. In reality, though, um, you have to give a, you know, a sort of a hierarchical list. In other words, try this one first and then try this one um, of possible fonts, po possible file names, formats, um, including checking for a local font, which you know will save them downloading if they do have it on their machine. Um, and this, the example here, the order of this is very intentional because this is um, partly trying to deal with IE, believe it or not. <laughs> um, so IE at the moment only supports um, this one uh, type. So you have to start with that. So you're trying to play nice with RE, RE <laughs> with IE. Um, the next thing, um, IE is going to ignore local. So then you're kind of good to put your list, and it's not going to break IE. Um, whoa. Sorry about that. Don't spill coffee on your keyboard. <laughs> Just a tip. Um, so the, the big issue with web fonts, now that you know, a lot of the types are supported and you can kind of um, juggle the different types is copyright. So, you know, the font makers didn't intend for these fonts to be available, served over a web server, right? They're so you download them to your specific machine and then you um, design your poster and you put out the poster. Um, so that's, a, that's an issue. Um, there are, though, some freeware fonts that do have the license available for, um, you know, to serve over the, over the web. One of those is Font Squirrel. I'm sure there's lots of others. Um, and then Font Hosting. Um, this one's new uh, Google Font API. Right now it has a really limited number of fonts, um, but it's free, it's open source, um, and it does a good job of managing which font, font to use and even um, calls in JavaScript at the last minute if necessary. Um, Typekit's a subscription-based service um, with a much larger library. The downside is you have to pay for it, with a few exceptions involving putting their logo on your site and only using it on one site. And so basically, it's it's not free. Um, but the same idea with Typekit, it's not so much open source fonts is that they've figured out the licensing. And so when you use their service, you're using the license legally. OK, so the question was, what's the status of tools like the Google Font Library? And there's now a Google Font Previewer, um, which I've, I've seen that. Um, and I, I think that it creates the, the CSS it creates for you makes it work with their library, right? So it's just a way of previewing the um, 
the service you'd be using from them. So that's part of what their service does. It'll generate code for you, um, assuming that you're you're serving the files, the fonts from their server. Okay, so more um, traditionally non-CSS CSS, and this comes in the form of transformations, um, which works in with animation, which we'll see. Um, translate just means you know change where it's located. Again, it's starting to feel a little bit flash-like, right? So the X is here, and you move the X over 200 pixels. Um, skew, rotate, and matrix, for those of you who are crazy graphics nerds, <laughs> or 3D nerds. Um, <laughs> the question was, <laughs> what's the matrix? And I'm not answering that. Um, so here's, you know, here's a simple one, scale. Um, and all of these, you're going to have uh, Moz or WebKit, possibly Opera too, but I haven't, um, I'm not up on my Opera, sorry. So, you know, it's pretty easy. You've got a scale if you want to do it all in one function or scale Y and scale X. You can actually do both of them in, this, in the scale function just with a comma here. Um, and the whole, you know, one is 100%. And so that's the, that's the scale for scale. That's a good question. I haven't seen that. The question was, can you, can you specify the registration point where it, you know, where it kind of grows out from? If that's available, it's probably browser specific. There's a, I saw something similar with 3D in WebKit. So it's, it's possible that WebKit has something, but I don't know of it offhand. So, um, and that sounds like something that if it's not here, it's probably coming because I can imagine designers asking for that. Um, skew is like you'd expect in Photoshop. Um, you've got an X and a Y, um, and then you also have skew X and skew Y. Um, in this one, you're leaving X alone with zero degrees and then skewing the, the y-axis by negative 25. And notice the, the unit here, degrees, which is uh, something new. Um, so before we get to real 3D, here's some fake 3D, right? So you can actually make things look 3D just by using things like skew and rotate and scale. Um, so this is a cube, but it's not a cube. It's three boxes, three, three divs that are skewed and rotated and so forth. And um, just to prove that I didn't make that up. That's what it looks like. And you can see. Um, my proportions are a tiny bit off, so <laughs> um, if this were fake, then it would look better than this. <laughs> um, so, and let me actually show the code for that. That might be interesting. Yeah, so it was on the slide too, but something along these lines where um, you've got these, these divs. So it looks like this, right? Div 1, div 2, div 3. And then you've got the transform. And notice that you've got to do it in WebKit and Mozilla. So you kind of double all of your properties at the moment. Um, so anyway, that's, that's that. So going from fake 3D to actual 3D, it works in a really similar way. You just add the z-axis, right? Um, and currently, it's supported in WebKit, basically. So Safari 5, iPhone, I don't know what version of the iPhone browser, um, Chrome 5. And then you have, you know, for instance, you have translate z, so translate it on the z-axis. Here's um, 
a close to full list. At least this first half is full. And then WebKit went and did some extra stuff. Um, the person who asked me about origin or the, the um, origin point, um, this is what made me think of that, is that they, they added this, um, this extra property to deal with uh, 3D. So this is um, this browser is the nightly build of WebKit, which is the only place I can get this example to work at the moment. But this is an example of changing perspective in 3D, and it also gives you an idea of what the 3D does. So, you know, here's if you're, and I'm I'm no 3D expert, but I'm assuming that this is. Um, kind of the close, oops, <laughs> the close view. Feel free to correct me. Um, and then this is actually changing the origin to uh, oops, to where the mouse is. And interestingly, all this stuff is still clickable, so I could copy and paste it. Um, all right, so animation. Here's the, the exciting part. Um, So we've talked about um, the transformations, right? So transforming, you know, the scale, um, the position, the skew, and so forth. You know, and you also have obviously your, um, you know, your standard stuff like width and height. So, and you've always, not always, but for a long time, you've had the hover um, property, which you can apply to the, you know, to box, for instance. Um, so you can, you know, you can hover this and change the width and height. What you can now do, and this was a, your question before, um, is here you're setting the transition property to um, transition these two properties, width and height, over the duration of two seconds. So that w so and notice that you're setting this kind of in the in the main definition, right? So that down here in the hover, um, you just change you just note what changes, and as you hover, this will happen. So the hover actually triggers the animation. So here's just a quick example of some some animation moving the these are all absolutely positioned, so moving the left property. Um, awesome. So, <laughs> I say awesome for everyone. <laughs> for awesome is on one page. <laughs> so on hover, the left changes from 0 to negative 200. So that's the really the only property change. Um, everything else comes in with the tri Transition. So this is um, this is one of those combined properties. So this is saying you're allowed to transition the left property. You can also say all, by the way. Um, 0.6 seconds, and it's a linear. That's what the question about easing. Linear is no easing, and there's also ease in and ease out. You know. So here's the. You know, if you wanted on click, for instance, you would just say on click, and then pull this in in a JavaScript way and set it with JavaScript. Um, but with target, you can actually access the URL here. So you have the anchor link, say start. So that effectively gives you click access, right? So if you're, if this is your um, link on the same page, it's obviously not going to refresh the page. It's as if you clicked down to a section of your file, right? Um, but as you know, that changes the URL and puts the um, pound sign start here. And then, um, or in this case, it would say pound C. So this div, when it's targeted, um, will transform, will do, will do a trick, right? Um, so, you know, so basically the name of the ID when the name of the ID of the element is used as an anchor target. So let me show a quick example of that. So this link 
um, if I click it, I cause the animation here, and you can see the URL says, well, if you can't see, it says target.html hash or pound C. Right? Um, probably. <laughs> oh, because I refreshed it and I didn't change the URL, it happened automatically. If I go to the, the normal version, and I mean, you could see how you could create a game this way, right? So you've got your button panel, which just sends you to these different targets, and all the animations happen based on that. That's all the stuff I have to show. Feel free to ask me questions. Um, if you want to go in-depth to CSS3, we're doing a class at Mark Hunt at the end of August. Um, then you can find out more from me or Sasha or the website. Um, thanks for paying attention, and I hope you learned something. <laughs>